Thank you, Matthias. Thank you. Oh, my little remote control seems to be missing. Just a moment. Can someone take my remote control? Pardon me, accessorizing can be difficult. So, hi there, I'm, I'm Rachel Neighbors. It's good to meet you. Guten Morgen, Mühen, Mühen, It's a little trophy. <laughs> so glad you could all be here today. I am, as Matthias says, program manager on Microsoft's uh, web platform team. I work on everyone's favorite browser, Edge. <laughs> we love you too. <laughs> You might know me from my work with web animation. I've written courses. I've done documentation with the wonderful folks at MDN. Love MDN. Uh, by the way, MDN, Microsoft partnering, kick ass. Uh, and also uh, founded the web animation community over at Slack.animation at work. Recently, I proudly published Animation at Work, the book, with a book apart. So excited about that. But. Let's talk about storytelling. I got into animation and interaction a long time ago, uh, partly because I love storytelling. Uh, the Brothers Grimm really inspired me when I was a, a teenager to tell stories in new and unusual ways, specifically with comics. Uh, some of my very first comics were fairy tale based. This one's from Russia, it's not German. But uh, by the way, no one's ever seen this before except for a submissions editor at a small press publisher. So special treat for you today. But then I ended up in web development, and I couldn't stop telling stories. This is a little interactive program that I did with a, a Russian cartoonist, and it got me into CSS animations and transitions, and it kind of took off from there. Even my talks involve a certain amount of storytelling. I storyboard and illustrate them. Even this one is illustrated. Today, I want to tell you a good story, but I thought, I should go an extra mile here. I'm not just going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you how to tell a story. This could be very useful at work. I'm going to tell you a story using uh, my favorite technique. It's called Kisho Tenketsu. Does anybody here read Japanese comics? All right, we've got some, got some hands in the air. OK, all right. Uh, well. This is a popular storytelling technique, and if you're familiar with Japanese, Korean, or Chinese tales, you may have recognized it. It's called Kisho Tenketsu. And it's different from the Western story arc, which has a beginning, a crisis, and then a conflict resolution. Kisho Tenketsu goes a little bit in a different direction. So it starts with an introduction. That's the key part. Then there's the development, or show. Then, toward the end, there's ten, the twist. There's always a twist, how something unexpected happens. And ketsu is the conclusion, how this unexpected thing, because of everything you learned during the development, combined with a twist, creates a future that you could not have imagined before. Now, this storytelling technique is actually pretty popular in the West as well. In fact, it's been uh, used by companies like Pixar for some time. Uh, everyone loves Pixar, right? So Pixar has this famous prompt that every cartoonist and animator knows. It's called the Pixar prompt. It goes a little something like this. And it's completely uh, based on this ki shoten ketsu concept. So once upon a time, there was. That's your setup. And every day, they, that, you know, you fill in the blanks here. And that's the that's development. And one day, this is a twist, something happens. And because of that, something else happens. And because of that, something else happens until finally, Resolution. So this is my favorite Pixar movie, Wally. Uh, who, who here loves Wally? Yes! Ah, who doesn't love watching uh, two ro robots fall in love? So one day, there was a little robot, and every day, he compacted trash. Until one day, a new robot arrived. Oh, and by the way, spoilers. Just cover your ears if you haven't seen this one yet. Uh, and then they found life on the planet. And then they went out to find where all the other life on the planet went, until finally these two robots brought life back to the planet. It's the same storytelling concept applied to a fictional story. But this storytelling concept is really good for telling nonfiction stories, like the one I'm about to tell you today about something that's near and dear to all of us. I'm going to tell you a story about the browser 
and how it is not a document reader. So without further ado, let's get our setup out of the way. Once upon a time, there was a web developer. And in these days, the web was more like a series of linked documents. It was an internet of documents, if you will. It wasn't very interactive. HTML docs just linked to each other. The only interaction that came in this environment happened with forms. People were clicking submit on them, sending things to a server, and waiting for a server response. It was very boring times. Poor web developer. All the other developers picked on them. You are not a true developer, said the Java developer. You can't make a video game, said the Flash developer. Even the designers picked on the poor web developer. This looks nothing like the PDF I sent you. You're not a good designer, said the designer. But web developers had hope. There was a browser called Netscape. And Netscape promised that one day, the browser would be where most people would do all their work, that software would live in the browser and become more important than operating systems themselves. This gave the web developers hope. But for most people, that seemed more like a crackpot dream, more like a, a joke than a prophecy. Poor web developer. So development. And every day, the web developer created designs using tables uh, and, and jQuery, because JavaScript wasn't very reliable. J app developers. Uh, tended to come from Java and Flash and did most of the heavy lifting or left things up to uh, server side. Even the designers would typically just get angry at them if the, the PDFs were not pixel perfect. Poor developer cried themselves to sleep every night. <laughs> That's actually a picture of me, but anyway. <laughs> then 1995 came along, and there was this memo from Bill Gates called the Internet Tidal Wave, where he basically said, hey, this Internet thing is pretty big. We should be paying attention to that. All hands on deck. Do the Internet. So two years later, only two years later, Internet Explorer 4 launched. And Internet Explorer 4 had some pretty big concepts in it, because essentially all the talent at Microsoft was like, go do the web. And they came up with some great ideas, like the document object model. Like, hey, what if everything on the page was an object, and you could access it with JavaScript? Wouldn't that be cool? And hey, a Ajax, why can't we do it asynchronously? That should be a thing. So jo asynchronous JavaScript, that was a thing. It was proprietary at first, but that's where it came from. And data binding was introduced as well. One year later, Internet Explorer 5 came out, and it introduced the performance and uh, the perf and comp needs that we needed to make these features really reliable on the web, really change how we built websites. All right, so this all happened over only two years. It's a pretty big deal, going from memo to having a really fast browser with these new features on it. And we like to label features cu feature clusters, right? Right now we have things like PWAs, which is service workers and HTTPS, et cetera. This cluster of features was called dynamic HTML, or DHTML. Anybody here from the DHTML era? Yeah, awesome. For those of you not raising your hands, you just got a history lesson. Uh, this, was, this was a stack overflow of the era. This is where I learned to make my first websites. It was called Dynamic Drive. Get it? Dynamic? Oh my gosh. And so at this time, everyone's like, oh my gosh, the web. That could be like a real thing. I'm excited. Are you excited? Suddenly, the web developer was working with more than static documents. So the twist. These often proprietary concepts introduced decades ago had a big impact on how the web became what it is today. And around 2004 and 2005, Gmail and Google Maps hit, and they wouldn't have been possible without DHTML's DOM, asynchronous JavaScript, and data binding. Five years later, we got Angular, Ember, and React. These things were built because of these features as well. It took a little while. So take a look at how this timeline starts to change. The era of DHTML is capped off with Gmail and Google Maps. Then five years later, we start seeing the JavaScript frameworks that we use today to run the web uh, cropping up using these same technologies. That's like a decade of incubation, more than a decade. So conclusion, let's think about what is hitting today that's going to shape the web 20 years from now. The web is steadily be becoming more than a series of linked documents. We're no longer making pretty pictures under glass. 
reproductions of PDFs, microfiche, in HTML. The DOM, AJAX, and data binding introduced two decades ago made it possible for app-like experiences to exist today. Netscape didn't survive long enough to see this come true, but there are machines out there today, like Chromebooks, that are essentially just browsers in a box, running all your software from the web. It came true. It happened. And it makes sense. Most desktop apps we use now live in the browser. And even if we aren't opening the browser to get at them, there's a good chance that they're still built on web technologies. Uh, who use, uses Visual, Sto uh, Visual Studio Code? Yes. Oh my gosh. Did you know it's built with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript? It is. It is. And it's using Electron. Electron is essentially like a Chrome browser that you shove your HTML, and CSS, and JavaScript in and then package and send to people as an app. It's like a browser in a virtual box. And there, here's a, this is Teams. It's another Microsoft product. Uh, and it uses web technologies and Electron today, too. They came to our summit this year. It was so fun to talk with them. They're some of my favorite people. They're very passionate about the web. Uh, they use Electron today, but they're really excited to be switching over to progressive web apps for Windows 10, because we're going to start making progressive web apps first-class citizens in our app store. Uh, app, literally, this is happening. The web is living in app stores now. It's so awesome. Uh, they're becoming first-class citizens, not just in stores like the Windows Store, but also Kindle Fire. You can package and sell uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript as apps there. And of course, progressive web apps have already hit the Android App Store. My friend Chris Wilson at Google likes to say that progressive web apps are just the new standard of the web, because they're using things like HTTPS and Service Worker, et cetera, the same way dynamic HTML became the new standard of the web. So PWAs take these best practices and make them standard issue. With interaction APIs uh, and access to stores, the web is officially taking its place as the platform of choice, especially in Win 10 and desktop. I'll leave, m I'll leave the rest of this up to Sarah. She's going to be talking a little bit later more about progressive web apps. I hope you'll make her talk. I'm looking forward to it. Static documents couldn't convey the range of human experience, uh, but DHTML provided the infrastructure for an app-like web. So we've got our timeline, right? Five years after Gmail and Google Map Maps, we got this letter from Steve Jobs around 2010. What he said was basically, Flash is not going to happen ever in iOS. Goodbye, Flash. And it's officially being rolled back on all systems now. And a lot of people are really happy that Flash is dead, spit on its grave, that sort of thing. But there are different reasons you should be happy about it. There are different reasons. So first off, after uh, Flash was booted from, inter uh, from iOS, interaction developers had to find or make other tools to do the same things with the iPhone's browser that they were doing on desktop. This resulted in new libraries. Entire tools moved from ActionScript to JavaScript, like GreenSock. I'll be talking more about that on the deep dive track today. Uh, taking this, this tweening library that was for Flash and then rewriting it in JavaScript for the web. Now we've got the sudden the sudden demand for these new APIs is resulting in things like the Web Animations API, which opens up the browser's rendering engine to JavaScript. Additionally, Web Audio API, it brings over, uh, it lets us do things with audio and uh, user interaction that we used to only be able to do natively. This is the Web Audio uh, API used to make this really cool uh, symphonic experience, which I turned the sound off because it was a little distracting, but you should check it out. And Internet uh, Intersection Observer, it was originally created to help people create uh, ads that would be less of a, a burden on, uh, on the viewing public. But it turns out that all these scrolling interaction libraries, they can just be done with inter Interaction Observer, and they're so much lighter and more performant. Shwetang Dixit will be talking uh, about how to build tools for folks with disabilities using APIs like web speech, web RTC, image capture, uh, and progressive web apps later today. You should totally check it out. So without Flash, the web was forced to come up with new solutions to these problems. Previously, browsers were just like, Flash, you figure it out. Now browsers have to figure it out. And web developers have to work with browsers instead of working with one company to figure these things out. It's a much more egalitarian future we've built here. So the web gained lots of new allies from the, the ex-Flash developers and interaction community contributing to and providing feedback on these new docs and standards. More community interaction with standards bodies like the W3C, What WTG, and TC39 drives the web in the direction we want it to go. 
you can already see this at work in browser animation DevTools. Uh, the Web Animations API made this flash-like timeline possible in Firefox's DevTools. And if you don't like that, you can build your own. Spirit just launched in Halloween, and it exports to GSAP. It's awesome. Another thing that was formerly thought impossible on the web, but now is a major part of it, is 3D. The first, at the first World Wide Web con con Conference in 1994, David Raggett proposed an HTML-like mark markup for VR called Vermal, or VRML. Well, it wasn't very popular, and it ended up turning into this tag-based syntax called Web3D and taken over by the Web3D consortium. But it's really, really useful in like military, educational, et cetera, kinds of fields because it's an archival type format. This is what it looks like. As you can see, it's kind of like the SVG of, of 3D content. It's very declarative. And of course, declarative models can only do so much. So of course, we need an imperative model. That's WebGL. WebGL comes out here. It's essentially uh, it's shepherded by the computer graphics industry's Kronos Group. They shepherd a lot of different uh, standards, a lot. <laughs> uh, oh, hang on. But WebGL essentially renders 3D content into a canvas tag entirely through JavaScript. Sketchfab has lots of really cool examples. I highly recommend you check out their site. But it's not just for fun. Uh, WebGL can be used to create things like this. This was made using the JavaScript library Cesium and Bing Maps. I, I met these people at SIGGRAPH last year uh, when I was traveling on a, uh, a work grant. And it's amazing to me that they could take these satellite images and WebGL and create 3D models using just JavaScript in the browser. This was, a, this was a big deal for them. And Context Capture, it's another company. They use consumer-grade drones to take videos from the sky, pictures from the sky, and turn them into 3D maps that they can then measure from. For instance, these people, they can send out a drone to anyone's, anyone's place of work, take a 3D model of whatever pile of rubble or whatever it is that is necessary, and then physically measure that for them. This was not possible previously. People had to take inaccurate measurements from the ground. It was very hard to do business. So these technologies, they're just leaking out in all different kinds of industries that are not related to web development. These are companies trying to do business on web, develop, on web developed technologies. So yeah, they may not be web companies, but they do use web technologies. So in turn, WebGL enables the virtual web. Hmm, let's see where that's going to go in 20 years. VR has been around since the 1980s. We like to think that we've discovered it, but when I went to SIGGRAPH, I met so many virtual reality developers who got started in the 1980s who were like, yeah, I did that back in the day. <laughs> yeah, you think you'd invented everything. I know how this works. Yeah, we found that problem. We fixed that. So it was a lot of fun. But this is what we thought it would be like in the past. You have to have all this equipment. It wasn't really consumer grade. It's once again been really popular in educational, military, scientific places, training doctors, et cetera. VR has been around. It just hasn't been in your living room. But you know, now it's available to consumers, both in high-end models and in kits that you can assemble yourself. There's an entry point for almost anyone in a, uh, in a first world country. And all the browsers have been working together on a web VR standard over at the W3C, which is excellent. We love to see browsers working together, yeah. Uh, there's even a community group you can join if you want to have an impact. We'll talk more about community groups later. The idea with WebVR is that you can pop into the web, at the uh, you can pop into a VR situation at the click of a button, like uh, pick which, which kind of experience you want to have. I expect we'll see this streamlined as the hardware and the APIs mature. We're in one of those places where there are many different access points, so it looks kind of messy. Currently, VR suffers from platformitis, not unlike the early web. However, Standards like OpenXR are coming to the rescue, and Microsoft recently joined OpenXR, along with like so many other people, it's awesome, giving all these different formats and all these different platforms a common interface to work off of. Hopefully, Apple will join soon. But VR is not augmented reality or mixed reality. Uh, those are different things. And Mozilla has just announced that they're going to expand their web VR work into web XR, the X being V, M, A, whatever your, your, your letter is. Felipe Torres, who's coming up right after I am, is going to cover uh, the state of virtual reality and browsers in more depth. I cannot wait for this. I really, really can't wait for Felipe to get up here. 
So the browser stopped being just a document reader so long ago. It has become a platform for open source technology and JavaScript driven experiences. The web we are pushing today, these seeds, they are taking hold. The seeds sown 20 years ago, they define what we do today. And I ask you to think about that. Think about what we're doing today and how it's going to impact the web of tomorrow. Consider specs like CSS Houdini, which essentially allows us to pave our own cow paths and write our own CSS. Or WebAssembly, uh, which will allow us to compile native code to something that a browser can read and be very efficient at reading. What I'm excited about with WebAssembly is there are a lot of things, a lot of content in our past that are specific to technologies that just aren't supported now, from Flash cartoons to DOS video games. I used to love King's Quest. It's getting harder and harder for me to play these every year. But with WebAssembly, we might not require any more emulators for these things. We might be able to carry forward our cultural heritage with us every year with the web. I'm excited about that. The loss of information is one of the, the most sad things that faces us as we race forward toward the future. Yeah, and Eric will be talking about uh, WebAssembly a whole lot later. Do you show up for that one? So 20 years from now, how are these things going to change how the next generation uses the web? I ask you to build the web that you want, the web that you want future generations to inherit. There's some ways to do that. I'm going to give you some brief, some brief examples here. But I ask you also to think about things like inclusion and accessibility. What we build today does impact how people use these technologies in the future in a huge way over decades. So, have impact. Talk to browsers. Most browsers, they have Twitter accounts. You can reach out to them and say, hey, uh, I, I really need this. I think this is a great idea. We're, we're not princesses in a castle. You can talk to us. Uh, browsers, you're our customers. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you need. You might think that we're just writing specs and you're consuming them, but actually, everything we do, we do because you, we want you to build for us, test with us, work with us. Support features that matter to you. Uh, you can go vote for them at User Voice for Edge, but different companies have different ways for you to give feedback about what you want. Uh, talk about them. Uh, promote them internally. Give brown bags. Teach. Uh, make sure that the features that matter to you are front and center in your life and that you evangelize them. File bug reports. Uh, if you run into a problem, don't just be like, well, I guess that's that. I'm going to walk away from it. No, no, no. Let that browser know that that feature that you need isn't working right. It really helps them. Join a W3C community or business group. This is a great little thing. I'm an invited expert at the W3C. Uh, I was lucky to have that happen, but you don't have to wait to be invited. You can get in on that conversation. You can make sure that you're pushing for what you need today. I ask you also, while you're using these features, that you use them responsibly. Concepts like progressive uh, enhancement allow us to integrate the shiny new thing that we need without blocking access from, for people on older browsers or browsers that haven't caught up yet. So I ask you to still you know, try to build a web that doesn't break. So let's sum up. Once upon a time, <laughs> once upon a time, the web developers, uh, they had little to work with back in the beginning of the interwebs. Uh, that was the key. Back in the beginning, 1995, not a whole lot to work with, right? Then, around 1997, 1998, this is the show, this is the development. Internet Explorer starts releasing these proprietary things that later go on to become open standards that run the web. It takes 20 years, but that's the twist. These proprietary things go on to become the web that we have today. It will keep happening. That leaves us to Ketsu. Because of this, the web can and will be a universal platform for everything. So the web is not a document reader. It is more than a series of linked documents. It is what we make it. All right, uh, that said, if you'd like to talk more about this or get a copy of my book, come talk with me later. I've got a deep dive track. You've been wonderful. Thank you.